All right. So this is how it is in life. I'm going to go ahead and dive in. This is how it is in life. All the time we have a perception. And usually our instinctive habit, when something isn't the way that we would like it to be, it's like, you out there, you're wrong. You fix it. You need to change. And sure, there's plenty of things out there in the world that are wrong and need to change. And most of them we can't fix. It's not as simple as turning off the extra microphone or unplugging the extra phone or whatever. They're bigger, broader, bigger problems that we have very little agency around. Like we do what we can to move the needle. And that's very important also. And while we're moving that needle, that little bit that we can move the needle or we're taking care of ourselves amongst the, all the gunk, the greatest thing that we can do is like recognize, how am I contributing to this? You know, with my own stories or my own input, like what's happening in here, in this, as Buddha would say, in this fathom long body, that I have some agency over. Like, where can I actually make some change? And it's hard to recognize because we're with ourselves all the time. We have all of our habits and things that are becoming more apparent to us, maybe as we pay attention or things that are not apparent to us or things that are apparent to us, but we're like, I still can't fix that. Like, but we can notice, oh, oh, it's as simple as, oh, it's because I'm also dialed in here, right? I've dialed in two ways. Or one of my teachers, Larry Ward, he talks about, Sometimes the glasses get really dirty. And those of you who have had the opportunity to wear glasses in your life, like you start to not be able to see very well. And it's very gradual. But then it's like, oh, I can't really see. Or maybe you don't even really notice that you can't see, but you somehow, like there's a speck or something happens and you have the inclination, or oh, maybe to clean my glasses. And then you clean your glasses. And something that you may notice if you start to pay attention, as Larry does as a Dharma teacher, is that more of the gunk on the glasses is on the inside <laughs> than is on the outside. But then we clean them, you know, we clean ourselves as best we can, not perfectly, of course. I think my glasses need to be cleaned, but we clean our glasses. We tend to our house, we clean ourselves. And then we can see more clearly. And we can see how we're contributing or how we can care for ourselves so that that thing that that other person is doing particularly a very close person in our lives, that thing that they're doing, it doesn't matter quite as much anymore. It's just happening. We don't take it so personally. We're not so caught in it. It's just like, oh, there they are in their habit. Oh, it's not about me, right? There's some freedom from it. And that's a way that anatta, this not self can show up. It's like, oh, it's just that thing that's happening out there. Sometimes the expression like water off a duck's back feels really good for me. I can notice in myself like, oh yeah, it's just like water off a duck's back. It's no big deal. It's still wet, but I'm not getting soaked, right? Hmm. Yeah, so thank you for that technology challenge to elicit this in me. I hope it's helpful for some of you and any of it that's not helpful. Just let it go, right? Let it go. It's not important. If it doesn't land, it doesn't need to land. It's no big deal. And it just so happens that the theme that I have in mind to talk about tonight is letting go. And so we'll get there in a little bit, but first we'll practice. So I like to begin often with a go around so you can kind of feel into and see who's here in the space. And I'm inspired this evening to hold that to the end. So those of you who are used to being here and kind of wondering where that is, I didn't forget. Just kind of moving things around. So take care of your body. See if your body needs to move or stretch in any ways. If you need a little bit more water, another layer. Maybe you need to take off a scarf or a sweater. Maybe the body wants to stretch in a big or small way. Care for yourself. And caring for yourself internally and externally. And asking in, you know, I love that trio of words of ask, ask, listen, act. Right? So you can ask in, what do I need? How can I care for myself in this moment? 
and listen to the response that emerges. And then act from that wisdom. Ask, what do I need? How can I care for myself in this moment? Listen. Listening in with our hearts. Act. I take that wise action or that kind action, the action born from discernment. Ask, how are you doing? What do you need? How can I care for myself in this moment? For your own variation on the theme. Ask, listen. Learning to listen into ourselves. And act. And allowing yourself to settle into stillness, whether standing or seated or lying down. Finding a supportive posture for tuning inward. for cultivating awareness and acceptance. I'm noticing if perhaps even just a little bit, the heart, mind, and body might begin to settle as you find this comfortable, supportive posture.
when the body finds stillness, things naturally begin to settle. Just like a bottle of apple cider. It's full of apple and spices and various things. And when you shake it, it becomes opaque. Very hard to see clearly. But when you put that same bottle of apple cider down and you allow it to just sit there, stand there, be there, lie there, when you put it down, You let it be. It settles of its own accord. All the spices and pieces of apple fall to the bottom. And most of the jar becomes clear, translucent, can see through it, can see clearly. And some wonderings might occur. Aren't I supposed to do something? What if the only doing was stopping and resting? Allowing yourself to be as you are. To really just be.
if simply being is available to you, please continue in that way. If you're wanting a little more support, you might practice bringing awareness into the direct felt experience of the body resting. Really feeling yourself rest. And if you find in the resting, you start to move to sleepiness or fall asleep, and you can lengthen your spine or open the eyes, gaze upon the floor, enjoying about 20 minutes of resting into the body and being here together in presence. Please enjoy these three bells to support a greater settling in. And at the close of our stillness practice, I'll invite two more bells. Enjoy listening, receiving, and letting go as the sound arises is sustained for a while and passes away. just like all conditioned things.
Resting. Resting into ourselves.
various experiences arising and passing in the field of awareness. Through all the sense doors, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, we can let them all be. Enjoying this break from doing. Allowing the body to rest. Experiencing the freedom that comes as we care for ourselves and tend to our posture and recognize what we need and meet our own needs. Creating the foundation such that we can rest, we can stop and allow things to settle. I'm not trying to white knuckle our ways through this or push through. This is a practice of caring for ourselves. And it's a practice of discernment. So that when we move, whether it's to 
get a tissue or change your posture. We're aware of the intention to move before we move. Now we move in choice rather than as a reaction. It's a training, it's a practice to notice the intention and to be in awareness of the movement with the movement. It's very different from the compulsive, reactive scratching of the itch. It's like, no, I have a need and it's in choice and it's wholesome. The automatic stretching of the itch doesn't often relieve the suffering of the itch. Maybe temporarily. And the movement is engaged in with kindness, awareness, attention. It has long lasting benefits.
and appreciating whatever level of awareness is here and bringing that awareness in to hearing, to receiving the sound of this bell arising and passing, feeling the full length of each sound of the bell all the way until you can no longer hear it. And then once you can't hear it anymore, gradually expanding awareness into movement and whatever level of sightedness is available to you as the eyes open. Feeling into the wisdom of your own heart to discern, to recognize what movements might be helpful for you. Small stretches, big stretches, little self-massage. Trusting in your own wisdom. May the practice help you access your own internal wisdom. And any benefit we might have generated by practicing together in this way. Mm -hmm. I offer it up for Tom's benefit, our usual volunteer and host who is continuing to recover from COVID. And for the benefit of all beings, may it bring peace. Mm. Thank you so much for your practice. Appreciate mm -hmm. you being here tonight and the opportunity to share practice with you. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective and tonight is specifically Mindful Mondays with Spiritual Friends Sangha. I love practicing as a collective kind of generally for many reasons. And one of the things that I especially like about practicing here so we're in the middle of the city. Know that there's stuff going on. There's someone walking overhead. There's water running. There's the sounds from the different systems that are caring for our temperature in here. There's people living their lives outside. And I think sometimes we think that like we're going to feel better or be able to settle or get comfortable or get our needs met. Once we get that external world, like all that and perfect and silent and all that. And that's not true. <laughs> and I think that being here and having the outside world doing itself helps us to realize that it's possible to be okay amidst all the stuff. And if not that, this knowing that I can control the stuff. You know, normally when I come and sit here, I'm loving everything. I'm loving the music and I'm loving what's happening outside and upstairs and all of it. And I'm returning from a few days at a monastery in Northern California where it is quiet. And so I noticed myself like 
not navigating all the sounds as well as I normally do. And it occurred to me that maybe for some of you, those sounds are more challenging than they are typically for me and a little bit more like they were today. So I'm glad to get to speak to it a little bit. I think that one of the gifts of practice, which is what I thought I would talk about tonight, so if I actually get started talking about it or not, is the practice of letting go. And with all the stuff that's happening, I'm not even talking about all the stuff that's happening in the world, but just the traffic and the sounds, with all that stuff that's happening while we're trying to like sit here, that can be an opportunity to practice letting go. Right? We have no, well, sometimes we might have some delusion, but we have no delusion that we can stop the sound of the traffic, right? Or the sound of the other people who use this building, right? Like we might have some aversion to it. We can care for the aversion. We can tend to the aversion. And that's one of the gifts of practice, like out in our lives. And so we can let go of that, that effort, that needing, that striving to make things some way other than they are, to make people some way other than they are, to make ourselves, to make ourselves some way other than we are. Like we're always changing, those people are changing, the environment's changing, like it feels like it's quiet right now. Right? Like it's kind of quiet right now. But we didn't make that happen. <laughs> you know, and I find that as my mind settles and my mind quiets, thanks to years of practice, right? Like not from one sitting, <laughs> I didn't make that happen either. Right? It's a gradual occurrence as we put the time in. That's it. There's no making going on. There's no doing going on. Like you might practice Anapanasati, mindfulness of the in and out breath. It's not my practice these days. So it's not what I teach here. I practice that for many years and you might practice it here. Great. You know, do your thing. And this practice of, of resting and being and attuning to what's here. And, and for the last several years, maybe a little different these days, but 2018, I started practicing with awareness of the experience of the body resting. And so I use that language here sometimes, like, can you feel the body resting? Can you feel into the body resting? And sometimes that's the weight of the body. These days, my knee is doing okay, which is part of what allowed me to go to the monastery because I need to sit in a respectful way there. But for many years, 2017, maybe 2016, my formal practice, and it still is, is lying down. Because that's what my body needed. And something really cool happened to me in that posture that supported this letting go. Right? Like, to allow the body to really rest and be held by the earth and settle. And then on retreat in 2018, the instruction for me personally, the suggestion that I was offered by a teacher to rest, to rest. <laughs> You know, like this over efforting that had been really present in my practice without me realizing it of like coming back to the breath, coming back to the breath, coming back to the breath. And something in that coming back to the breath that had implicit in it for me, I don't think it's intended to be there, but that I found myself experiencing was like that I was doing something wrong, that attention had wandered from the breath. Even though like I knew, like I had lots of ideas that it was okay. I still, there was still some, no, come back. Come, no, no, come back. Like, and I would teach and I would remind myself, oh, celebrate the moments of noticing. You know, it's so great that you notice this moment of mindfulness, savor that, like all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that. I think that it's true. And this, this other thing that I've been doing for several years now of, just resting, 
by giving myself a break. And I think that in the resting, there's more I'm having, I'm noticing for myself, more a cultivation of letting go. It's like, it's okay, whatever it is. I don't have to fix it. I can't fix it. It's like I can let go. And I don't mean to say that it's the same as this next thing that I'm about to talk about, but I think that there's something in there that's similar or there's some way that it's akin to the practice of renunciation. The Buddhist path is a practice of renunciation. A couple of weeks ago, as we do each month, we explored the five precepts in one form or another, which we do on the first Monday of every month. And the five precepts in the Theravada tradition, as they're translated into English, they're all about not doing something. Not doing is an act of renunciation, right? Choosing to, for some period of time, not engage in social media, or maybe we turn our phone off or put it on airplane mode, or at least do not disturb, or the ringer's silent or whatever. Like that's an act of renunciation. It's a not doing. And there's a freedom that comes from that. Not killing, not stealing, not lying, not engaging in sexually harmful behavior, not indulging in intoxicants that lead to heedlessness. Like that's not doing. It's renunciation. It's a letting go of these behaviors and habits. And when we do that, it starts to like kind of clean things up a little bit or clear things up. I remember a teacher once suggesting that that practice, when we engage in the five precepts, that when we sit down, and of course, sitting down doesn't have to be into a seated posture, lying down, standing, finding stillness, or even walking meditation. When we sit down, There's a little less gunk there that has to be cleared away because we've kind of been tending to it. And even like with Anapanasati, where we're coming back to the breath, coming back to the breath, coming back to the breath, and that that's the practice, right? It's not about being crazy glued to the breath. The precepts are like that, that we return to them. We're not trying to do them perfectly. That's not what it's about. We're practicing letting go. You can't do them perfectly. Even monastics, they have processes in place where they can name, oh, I transgressed. And it's, it's okay, you know, it's expunged. <laughs> you know, like we're humans. We're not perfect, you know? It's not how it goes. So on this topic of renunciation, in the Theravada space, the monastics wear robes. And the robes are usually kind of in a certain color palette. And I had I remember being walking in the woods with Bhante Gunaratna, just like five or six of us, three monastics and two or three lay people. And he was talking about the trees. And each each year, or not all of the trees, but the trees in West Virginia. <laughs> Out here is a little different because we have so many evergreens, but the deciduous trees, they drop their leaves every year. If you think about that, you can recall some of those colors. They're all kind of in this spectrum from yellow to orange and red and brown. You think of like the yellow of the oak leaf or I don't know what mahogany leaves look like, but I know mahogany wood, right? Mahogany wood is really red. Certainly maple leaves can get really red. And then sometimes are kind of brown, right? It's like this whole range. And the monastic robes in the Theravada tradition are all those ranges of color. From yellow to orange to brown in the Plum Village tradition, they're brown. It's this range of color and the leaves drop. <laughs> they fall, they let go. They let go. And I tell you, as we learn to do that, as they learn to let go, we find freedom. The same way that freedom is found in this act of renunciation. When we let go of our, 
our need for things to be the way we would want them to be. When we let go of our preferences, it's not that we don't have preferences, right? That's, it's fine. But what if we weren't attached to them? What if we weren't attached to them? Having spent some time at the monastery recently, my love being at the monastery, it's very nourishing in so many ways. And the Theravada tradition, I think quite broadly, and definitely specifically in the lineage that I practice in um, with monastics who are students of the late Ajahn Chah, it's misogynistic. It's sexist. It's embedded in it. And so it's a really powerful practice for me, as we say in the 12-step rooms, <laughs> take what you like and leave the rest, right? To be able to benefit from that which is there to be benefited from and not try to change it. I'm not going to change a 2,600-year-old tradition. Mm. And the more I can go there, go to a Bayagiri, go to this Ajahn Chah branch monastery, physically, and to go there, like not having to fix it or change it or make it different than it is, the more freedom I experience. So it's not a piece of the freedom I thought I would get by practicing in that lineage or practicing with those monastics. But it's kind of amazing. Because it's like, yeah, I can be a feminist and I can live my life and I can stand up for various things that I believe in and live my life that way and maybe protest and march and talk to people who are interested and not try to change you. You're not trying to change them. Not trying to like preach at someone. To allow them and allow people, and sometimes allow myself to be as I am, like to let go of that notion that I know. To let go of the notion that I know what's best for someone else or some other community or the best way to do the thing. And we get caught in that. And we get caught in that anyway. And we can know what we want in a moment. And that's beautiful. And when we can communicate it in a kind, skillful way, like, can I have a kiss? It's a gorgeous moment. It's a gorgeous moment. But when we think we know what someone else should be doing, then we get ourselves into trouble. We can make requests or make suggestions, right? I mean, I'm not a parent, so I don't know what that's like, but I think that in raising children, you offer them suggestions and guidance. And when we do it skillfully and we model it, they might be inspired to do it. But when we're yelling at someone about how they're supposed to behave, you know, how interested are they? I'm not very interested. And so what is it like when you're yelling at yourself about how you're supposed to behave? That doesn't feel very good either. And what happens when we greet ourselves or we greet our loved ones with gentleness, with kindness, when we let go of our notions of how they're supposed to be behaving or what they should be thinking or how they should wash the dishes, you know? <laughs> what if we can let go of that? And make our clear kind requests, right? That both of those things can be there. So because of the misogyny, I don't know if misogyny is too strong of a word, because of the sexism, in the Theravada traditions and in Thai forest monasteries, Coming back from the monastery was looking to, oh, 
what are some of the ayas doing? What are some of the female ajans doing? What's going on? And I, I read a little bit and more than one was mentioning that their time in the monastery, that practice, being with nuns, so forgetting about this, they also were talking about the misogyny or sexism. I know that it's women hating, so let's just sit with sexism, the sexism that's happening there. Aside from that, just being in their community of nuns, it's just like, I feel like I need a little asterisk over here about, in that whole space, which we're not going to go to tonight. I don't know that I'm ever going to go there. So I'm not the person to have the conversation. But even though there might be space for nuns or monks, there is the limitation that you need to be, I don't know if you need to be, but they're not, they're, they're, they're not quite on the edge of growth to welcome non, non-gender conforming binary trans communities, right? So like they're having a hard enough time with cis women. So like, just like just naming that truth. And that's the space I'm going to explore right now as a cis woman myself. So these nuns, just practicing amongst us women, giving up, needing things to be done their way, letting go of that. It's one of the biggest things for them, like greatest opportunities for learning, the greatest challenge, the most unexpected kind of thing that was really powerful. And, And maybe that's the greatest act of letting go. You know, letting go of the notion that we know what's best or we know what's right or that needs to be done my way. Like, yeah, maybe we have a great idea and it could be implemented and it could be fabulous. And maybe there are a thousand other ideas that are useful or worthy of exploring. And I think that that's something that we can practice wherever we are. We don't have to go to the monastery to practice letting go of the notion that we know the best way to do the thing. I remember a teacher of mine, not even in a Buddhist space, but in, in, in grad school, asking us, how many ways are there to slice an orange? And if your mind is like many conditioned minds that are experienced with slicing oranges, you probably have a few visuals that come to mind. I slice it this way or this way, or maybe this way, and maybe number starts to arise. But then when you feel into the question and you're reminded of where the question's coming from, it's like, oh, there are an infinite number of ways to slice an orange. Infinite. And maybe one of them is more well suited to a particular thing than another. And when it's something less tangible than an orange, it can help us trust into, yeah, maybe this is is okay. (laughs) You know, maybe I could try it this other way. If you're not infringing on me. No, this is not about allowing someone to do something to us. It's not okay. It's not what I'm talking about at all. Right, and this practice of letting go, we still hold our boundaries, right? Like, no, no, my space, uh uh-uh. And we don't have to like try to get in someone else's space all the time. And one last thing on letting go that's, that's here for me right now, is that in this practice of letting go and this practice of acceptance, It's that we let go of ourselves, right? We continue to notice what we need and to meet our needs as best we can. And part of that is setting boundaries and saying no and speaking up and speaking out and all of that. And part of that is like brushing our teeth, taking a shower, getting some sleep, going to the doctor, right? Like, Letting go is not reckless abandon. I think it's maybe one of the ways that this this teaching on the middle path can be spoken to in Buddhism, right? It's not all the way 
to asceticism where we and self-mortification where we're not eating enough and it's not all the way to gluttony, but it's something in between. And the letting go is similar. It's like there's things to be let go of, but it's not just like surrendering into nothing. Even the monastics who give up everything, own nothing. They still have the four requisites of food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. There's still a level of care that's necessary to sustain this human existence. For the Buddha taught that freedom is found in the body, this fathom long body. So we have to tend to the body. We have to tend to the eyes, to the ears, to the nose, to the tongue the whole of the body and the mind. So I thought I was also going to talk about the five remembrances. So maybe I'll remember to do that next week. But I think that there's a something in in them that there's that's infused with letting go as I was reflecting in preparation today. But that's all that came out. So maybe next week or maybe sometime soon. If I don't get to it soon, please remind me. So thanks for listening. Thanks for your kind attention.